Well, good evening again, church. It was sure weird to sit off in the wings knowing that I was about to come up and preach and then watch our youth pastors do announcements because that was the rhythm for so long, but it was me. And so uh, it was really cool to watch another generation come up, and it's been really cool to watch those guys lead your youth. And so if you have youth-age kids here and you're not uh, bringing them on Wednesday nights to the youth group, man, I would encourage you to. I think it's a cool era here at Life Community Church that you're going to want to be a part of. Uh, If you don't know me, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here, and we have been in uh, a study of the book of 1 Corinthians for a while. And we find ourselves tonight right at the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6. And so if you have your Bibles, we'll be there in a minute. You can start finding your way there. But um, confession time, I really like movies. Like... I waste a great deal of my life watching movies, and I've brought my family into that, and it's a pastime in our home. We're constantly scrolling for something new to watch, Uh, and and actually, to be honest with you, I'm pretty satisfied watching some of the good ones I've already seen, right? I'm one of those people that I could rewatch a movie because it's good. There's something about a story that's compelling, that, that captures the, the audience. There's something about wanting to be involved. I identify with a character. And have you ever noticed there are kind of like these different categories of movies? And I don't mean like kids' movies and, and then action movies. I mean that there are some themes that sort of find their way into lots of different kinds of movies. And a theme that I've noticed is uh, imagine a movie where someone is living their life and they find out that they aren't who that they thought they were, right? Like total recall, right? We, f- we find out that this guy actually has been living in some weird manipulated dream thing and he sort of comes to his senses or the matrix, right? And we've got Neo who thinks that he's uh, um, uncomfortable in life. He doesn't know why. And then he's sort of exposed to the truth. There's a really cool movie that came out a while back with Leonardo DiCaprio in it called The Man in the Iron Mask. And it's about, uh, it's about a, a twin of King Louis in France who was kept in prison. He didn't even know that he was actually the rightful heir to the throne. And then he gets broken out and it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of cool movies that have this theme that, that the main character doesn't know who they really are. Like even Luke in Star Wars, And out of all of these really cool, like, manly movies that are really fun and and have all of this adventure and there's this sense of purpose that sort of develops in the main character, one of the best ones is The Princess Diaries. Have you guys seen The Princess Diaries? Came out in, like, 2001. It stars Anne Hathaway. She's like a, a teenager in high school, and somehow they made Anne Hathaway homely. She's this goofy-looking teenager. She has really not got any friends. She's got a single mom. And then out of the blue, she gets a visit from this mysterious British-sounding lady. And come to find out, she's heir to the throne in some European country. And the whole movie is about her sort of coming into her own because she wants to act like this high school student with no friends, and the reality is that she is in line to rule a country and has to learn what that means. She has to become who she really is. There's something I've noticed, though, in every one of these movies, that when you don't know who you are, you're bound to act like who you're not. And when when they don't know, How could they live into it? So when you don't know who you are, you're you're bound to act like who you aren't. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a passage where Paul is saying something very similar to the Corinthians. I think we're going to see where Paul says, you don't know who you are. I can tell. I can tell by the way that you're acting. You must not know who you actually are. And I'm not sure that we're all that different than the Corinthians. I wonder if Paul were writing a letter to the modern American church, if he'd have a passage very similar to this in there. And so if you have your Bibles, you can open to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, Last week we finished chapter 5, but we're going to go back and cover just a couple verses. And so to, to remind you where we're at in the book, 
Paul has been confronting the Corinthian church about issues in their church life. And what they had, this problem that they had in 1 Corinthians 5 is that there was sexual immorality in the church and they were proud of it. They were tolerating it. They were so enthralled with the grace of Jesus that they were like wearing their sin and not dealing with it as a whole church. And at the end of that conversation or that rebuke, we get verse 12. He says, what business, business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. So expel the wicked person from among you. And that leads us right into chapter six. So we're just going to read the first few verses. If any of you has a dispute with one another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters... Do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? So I don't think that Tim was being mean to me. But I do think the way that the calendar worked itself out was I'm scheduled to preach today, and then we get this passage where Paul is confronting Corinthian believers because they're suing each other. And I'll admit, when I first read that, I thought, this is going to be a really short sermon. Right? Like, here, here's how it works. Um, don't sue each other, everybody. Try to figure it out on your own. Let's pray. Can you imagine if that's today's sermon? I think, I think uh, actually, I think some people would probably be high-fiving me on the way out, and I'd have a couple uncomfortable conversations in the corner. But really, that is the direct application of this passage. When you read this, it means that as Christians, we shouldn't be suing each other. We shouldn't be taking each other to court for lawsuits but can I be honest, that's not really something that most of us are struggling with. I'm not sure I've ever had anybody in my office telling me that they're frustrated because they're being sued by a church member. I think it happens. I, I do think that there are some weird things. In fact, they hit the news sometimes where somebody's suing a church because they didn't make it into an elder board or they didn't, you know, a dispute wasn't worked out the way that they want. But it's rare. It's not that common. And so... When I first got this, I was actually a little bit kind of frustrated. I didn't know what we were going to talk about today. But then as I was studying it, I noticed something. Something stood out to me. And I actually think it's very important. And I think it has something to teach us about ourselves. And so what I want to do is everything that I just read, I'm going to put it all up on the screen at once. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 6, 5. And what I want you to see is how many times the word judge is repeated in there. Now, I don't know if you have ever learned this or not, but whenever you're studying your Bible, if something's repeated, it's worth stopping and figuring out why. Why would the author say something over and over and over? And notice what Paul is saying. He says that I don't have any business judging the world, but man, we should be judging. We should be sorting out stuff in the church. God's going to judge. And then he says, if anybody has a dispute, why are you looking for judgment from non-believers? And he goes on. This word judge in, in the Greek is krino, and it actually means to judge. I was, I, I don't know if you guys know me or not. I really like to dig into the words because I'm expecting some like really cool aha moment. And I'm like, see, they got it wrong. What it really means is, and this time they just got it right. <laughs> it really does mean to judge. It, it means to pronounce an opinion concerning right and wrong. Figuring out what's right. What's the right thing to do? Now, 
I had to do some research, but I figured out what the Roman judicial system looked like at this time. And actually, there was a lot of steps. If you wanted uh, to take somebody to court, the first step was that actually you had to find them in a public place. And in public, you had to accuse them in front of people, charge them with a lawsuit, and then physically take them to the magistrate. That was step one. Then you'd go before a magistrate, before a government official, and they would determine the injury and the terms. Does this even make sense? Should we even care? But then the magistrate wouldn't try the case. The defendant and the other one. What's the other word? No, the one who's... The plaintiff, you guys are so helpful, thank you. The plaintiff and the defendant had to find a third party called a judex, and that was basically just a lay person that they trusted. There was this other person involved, and they would bring testimony, they would tell them their complaint, they would sort it out together, and the judex would actually have the authority to make a judgment, but no power to enforce it. And so after the judgment was made, you'd go back before the magistrate, and then the magistrate would put a stamp on it and say, yes, you owe this, or you have to be a slave for this long. It's quite a process. It involved a lot of different people, and it involved starting in a public place. And what's interesting is, just like a lawsuit now, the goal was to have somebody else tell you who's right. The goal is to have somebody else tell you what's right, what's wrong, who's in the right. See, Christians were looking to the godless culture around them to decide what to do. I think Paul is saying you're looking to the culture to tell you what's right. You're looking to the culture around you to tell you what to do, how to live. And you're looking to this culture to find out what's right and wrong. You need them to judge for you what's right and wrong? Are you kidding? It's a good thing that the modern church doesn't ask the culture how to live. Right? Right? So it's a good thing that we're never looking to culture for our cues in life about what's right, what's wrong, about what we deserve, or what's appropriate. What are you allowed to talk about in conversation? About what's noble? What are the things that we should look up to in a person or in a society or a business? What's off limits? What about the social issues? I think the reality is the church has spent a great deal of years letting the culture tell us what's right and wrong. Does the culture get to dictate church behavior? That's what's at stake in this passage. And see, what I think ends up happening for Christians is we take something from the culture, something that we like or something that we appreciate or, or we've learned, and then what we do is we hide it in a Bible verse. We take some sensibility or some perspective from the world around us, and then to make ourselves feel better, we will proof text it with some verse out of context in Scripture and tell everybody that it's part of our faith. And can I be honest that I find myself wanting to do this sometimes too? That the culture around me, the culture that we live in, is pretty persuasive. Like, I struggle with wanting homosexuality to be okay because I see great people that are gay. The culture around us is at a, at a fever pitch that is the issue right now in our culture, and something in me wants to agree, because I love people. I don't want to see people hurting. I don't want to see people picked on. Something inside of me says, I would love to just make an adjustment. Couldn't we change a little? I also find myself struggling with this because I, I, I'm never really satisfied with my lifestyle. I drive a Dave Ramsey special truck. 
You guys know what that means? I'm in that era where like I am milking the value of this truck. Uh, I'm, uh, it, it literally, it has a problem. Mechanics in the room, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, it has this problem where it will turn itself off while I'm driving. Completely shut it off, all of it. It turns right back on. I just have no power steering while I go into neutral and turn it back on in traffic. <laughs> but I end up thinking about a new car every time I drive past a car lot. I look at new houses. My wife and I drive around town and pick out better landscaping. What would it be like if I had more money in the bank? And I feel justified in my discontent because that is the drumbeat in America. It's so easy to be influenced by the culture around us to find out what's right and wrong, how to live, what we should do. Now this word judge in the Greek, it does mean judge, but it also has this sense of authority. You know, it would make sense, actually, because the person who passes judgment has authority over you. The person who has a right to make the decision has authority in your life. And I think what Paul is bothered by here is that this church keeps subjecting itself to the authority of the culture. It keeps going to the, the culture and saying, what do we do? And by definition saying, the culture gets to decide. The culture is the authority. And I think Paul would say here, I don't think you know who you are. Remember, when you don't know who you are, you're bound to act like who you aren't. And so there's another repeated phrase in here. It goes all through chapter 6. And we see it twice in this passage. He says, or do you not know? And then he talks about God's people. He says, I don't think that you know who you are. I think it's obvious because of how you're acting. Look at you taking, like, you're, you're, you're suing people. You're taking people to court in front of unbelievers. Don't you know who you are? And then he says this. Do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? Think about that for a minute. You're the Lord's people. And he's saying here, don't you know that there will be a moment whenever you are responsible for deciding what's right and wrong about culture, about passing judgment on the world? Jason, um, I thought God was going to judge, right? Like, I I thought God was going to judge the world. And you're right. Over and over, the Bible is full of of descriptions of God as a judge, the authority to decide ultimately what's right and wrong. But what's interesting is that God the Father chose to share his authority with Jesus. Check this out. 2 Timothy chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. And it, and it goes on. But what he's saying here is the Father is going to share his authority and his judgment with the Son. In fact, in Acts 17, verse 30, It says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So God the Father is going to judge the world by or through Jesus. But then Jesus says something interesting too in Revelation chapter 3. In verse 21, he says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So not only does the father share with the son, the son shares with you. Think about that for a second, that the throne, the seat of authority in heaven and on earth one day, might have you sitting in it. 
that you'd be sitting next to Jesus, sitting next to God with responsibility and authority. And in some weird sense, we're going to be responsible to help him judge the world. We're going to be in a position over them, over the culture. And then what's even more mysterious in this passage is he says, we're going to have the authority to judge angels. I don't even get that. Right? Like, I, I, can, I can show you in Psalms 8 and, and in Hebrews 2 that we were made a little bit lower than the angels, so right now it makes absolutely no sense. But apparently, whenever we get to sit on Jesus' throne, we get to skip a level. I don't know. I don't know. I don't get it. But in Romans 8, Verse 16, it says that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So if all of that's true, then it makes sense that Paul would be kind of frustrated with these people. You can't even figure this out on your own. You guys will judge the world. You're going to judge angels. You have the spirit of God. You're an heir of God. You are a co-heir with Christ, and you have to go to the culture to figure out what's right and wrong. A godless culture that's going in a different direction. And so I think the first stop through our message today is this idea of who we are. You, believer, are an heir to the kingdom of God. Believers are the children of the king of kings, heirs to his kingdom, and we will inherit authority. You realize that whenever you believed the gospel, it wasn't just a change in your destination. It was a change in your citizenship that you got. They could write a movie about you, you don't even know. You don't even know who you actually are, and it makes sense that you wouldn't live into it. And I think Paul is saying, don't you guys know? Obviously not, because you're not living into who you actually are. You're an heir of the kingdom of God, so stop subjecting yourself to the culture that you're one day going to judge. You have no need for the culture to tell you how to live, to determine what's important to tell you what's right and wrong, to influence your worldview. You have a direct connection with the author of life. And he has already told us how to live. And yet so easily, we put ourselves back under the influence of the culture around us. He goes on. We're still in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 6. It says, but instead... One brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have completely been defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? I think he's pointing out how selfish and petty and self-focused most of these lawsuits were. Now, I don't think he's saying here that believers shouldn't worry about justice when there's a crime. I don't think that's the point. He's not saying that justice shouldn't be done. What he's saying here is you guys don't realize the damage that you are doing to the gospel by being all about yourselves. See, they were bearers of the gospel message, the connection between a lost world and the God that loves them. And they were supposed to be an ambassador for the gospel, and instead they were an embarrassment. In fact, they were directly contradicting the gospel. Right? Isn't isn't the gospel about forgiveness and grace? And yet they were petty and vengeful and unforgiving with their own brothers, with their own church members. He's saying, you're making the gospel look bad. See, the culture around you 
isn't seeing a transformed life, he would say. They're, they're seeing the same petty, selfish, self-promoting, vengeful behavior that they see in their family, that they, they got hurt by. They see in you what they see in themselves. What difference is that going to make? See, what the world sees when they look at us matters. And I think we have somehow taken the gospel and we have watered it down to the point that it is so palatable, it is so easy to accept that it has become cheap and unappealing to the world around us. I think the modern church and and us Christians are to blame, have blunted the gospel by living just like the world while calling out to them that they should be saved from their lifestyle that we're joining them in. I had a conversation with a friend this week. Uh, I got to go golfing with a kid I used to have in youth group. And um, It had been a while, it had been a few years since we really spent any time together, and during this conversation, um, he's about to move, and so I I was really trying to make sure that we could talk about the gospel, and so I brought it up. By the way, the moment I start talking about the gospel, my golf game gets way worse. If you ever want to beat me at golf... (laughs) We started talking about the gospel, and, and... I wanted to know, could, could I get something from him that, because I'm a pretty good arguer, right? Could we, could we have an argument? Could I win him over somehow? You want to know what his biggest frustration or, or, or trepidation is? He said, I see so many Christians who believe Jesus was the son of God and he died for their sins. And then I don't think they actually love God. He's like, I don't want to be just one more hypocrite and pile of hypocrites. For him, it would actually make more sense. It would have been more attractive if he was looking at people whose lives had changed so much that he would go, I want to be like that. But instead, he's like, it's, you're just like me, but you have a hypocrite label on you. I don't want that. It was heartbreaking because he's right. I didn't have a good answer other than that's not how it's supposed to be, (laughs) right? That he should have a genuine affection for God that transforms his life. But he hasn't seen um, in the culture, he has seen bright spots of believers, but he hasn't seen in the culture where that's what Christians do. And so step two on our journey through this passage about who you are, you are an ambassador for the gospel. We talk about who you are. Remember, if you don't know who you are, you're bound to act like who you aren't. You're an ambassador for the gospel, but it is so easy for us to become an embarrassment for the gospel. Because an ambassador would be about advancing the kingdom of God. That would be my main priority, but it is real easy for the advancement of the kingdom of Jason to be all that I actually worry about. Yesterday, I was, uh, I was picking up groceries. My wife had put in an order at Walmart, and so I went and I parked and told him I was there, and, and, and I started playing uh, Wordle on my phone. If you guys don't know what Wordle is, uh, I'll beat you at it. Um, I was playing a game on my phone, just sitting there waiting for the guy, and, and, he, and he showed up. He knocked on my window. I rolled down my window just long enough to acknowledge, yeah, that's my order. I'd like it in the back seat, and I went back to playing my game. I basically ignored him. I I didn't interact with him as he's doing what he's doing. And then he had to move my sweatshirt in the back seat in order to put the groceries in. And I have a Vineyard Church sweatshirt. And he said, I have one of those. And I I stopped. Do you go to one of the local Vineyard Churches? That's really, and he he looked really confused. I said, does it have this logo? And he said, yeah, it does. And I said, well, this is is a Vineyard Music Worship logo. And he goes, oh, somebody must have gave it to me. And then he just shut the door and walked away. I was so worried about myself that I was intentionally ignoring him. And it was like God just poked me a little bit. Which kingdom are you worried about? Right? What if I had started that conversation when he got there and helped him? And what if I had been about God's kingdom and what it might mean for the gospel in that moment? Would that have gone somewhere? I don't know. 
Because it's so easy for the kingdom of Jason to be the one that I care about. When it sinks in that you are an ambassador of the gospel, you realize that you need to make your kingdom less so that you can make God's kingdom more. There's only one of them that's going to show up in your life. All right, let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 8. Remember, he, he just got done saying that you're doing this in front of unbelievers. Wouldn't you rather be cheated? Wouldn't you rather be wronged? Verse 8, instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? See, not only do you refuse to forgive and extend grace not only are you um, unwilling to let sin happen to you, you're also the bad guy. You're the cheater. You're the wrongdoer. I think Paul's starting to get a little bit angry at this point in his letter. He said, again, do you not know? That phrase comes up again. I'm not sure you know who you actually are. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty long list, you guys. There's some stuff on there that I recognize, right? And see, what I think Paul is saying is there are two types of people. There are people who are going to inherit the kingdom of God. And there are people who are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, let's look at what defines this category of people. So he starts listing off these descriptions and we, we covered this last week, and so I'm not going to go in depth on all of those different descriptions, but I want you to hear he, he's not saying something that should cause you as a Christian to be nervous about your faith. What he's saying is this is how unbelievers act. These are the types of things that is going to bring judgment in their life. People who will not inherit the kingdom look like this. And then verse 11 and that is what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I love that he says that is what some of you were. He just got done telling them that they're the ones cheating. They're the ones doing the wrong. He's telling them, you guys are doing these things. But then he says, but that's not who you are. That's who you were. You used to be in that category. That category of people who weren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. But not anymore. It's who you were. But you were washed. Like you were, you were filthy with the stains and the grime of that lifestyle. And it was affecting the way that God saw you. He saw you as dirty and filthy, but now you've been scrubbed clean. He doesn't see you that way anymore. You've been washed. You've been sanctified. It says your, your lifestyle was bent on self-pleasure and self-destruction. You were living opposite of how God wanted, but now you're transformed. Sanctification is the process that God puts us through to make us more and more like his son. That is what life change is, sanctification. And he says you were justified. You were guilty. You were on track for punishment. When the judge looked at you, guilty was what he was expecting to say, but your debt was paid, and now the great judge has declared you innocent. 
Now when he looks at you, free to go is the judgment. Paid for. What I want you to notice is that all of those things, those three things, washed, sanctified, and justified, are all in the passive voice. They all were done to you. Not by you. He said, that's who some of you used to be, but then God got a hold of you and he washed you so he doesn't see dirty anymore. He sanctified you so you're having, you should have a transformed life now and he justified you. You're free. You're innocent. Paul is saying, stop living like who you were and start living like who you are. See, when we understand and we believe the gospel, what we're doing is we're declaring that we've been living in a way that is offensive to God, and then we trust him to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness, to sanctify us to new life, to justify us in his presence. And the way that he did that was by sacrificing his own son. That God the Father would send God the Son to earth to die a brutal death in our place to absorb the wrath of the judge that was rightly ours to bear. That's what happens whenever we accept the gospel. That's the transaction that we are making. My lifestyle should earn me hell, and God is giving me heaven because Jesus paid the price. That's the trade. And then it's like spinning in his face to go back and live that lifestyle. Wasn't the, gospel, wasn't the point of the gospel to say, this is wrong, and I'm sorry. Wash me. Sanctify me, justify me. How arrogant that then we would go back and say, but I'm going to live that way. That I'm going to keep doing the things that you just paid for. Now, from a theological standpoint, he paid for the ones you're going to do in the future too. But imagine it from a relational point of view. That your father in heaven wanted you to join him so badly that he sacrificed his own son for all the things that you just carelessly keep doing. And yet, if that's what the gospel is, why is it that the modern church is still full of people on that list? A couple weeks ago, we talked about biblical sexual morality and how that might be the most satisfying thing, the most satisfying option. But do you guys realize it's not the most common option in the church? I'm not talking about out there. In the church, porn, sex before marriage, open marriages, affairs, the culture's version of morality has been adopted by the church. And I know way too many Christian alcoholics. Did you guys notice drunkards were on that list? There's some generous Christians, but there's some greedy ones too. Greed was on that list. Slanderer was on that list. And we have figured out in church culture how to turn that somehow into a good thing. Hey, I've got a prayer request about Betsy. Did you hear what pastor said to so-and-so? And we slander people and we talk behind their back. And so our third stop on this journey through a conversation about who you are, you are a former offender former offender. That's who you are. But remember, when you don't know who you are, you're bound to act like who you aren't, and it's so easy for us to be a current offender. See, if you really knew who you were, and this is Paul's point, if you really knew who you were, an heir to the kingdom of God. You wouldn't take your cues on life from the culture around you. You'd take them from the word of God. 
If you really knew who you were, you wouldn't seek the advancement of your own kingdom while ignoring God's kingdom because you're an ambassador of the gospel. If you really knew who you were, you wouldn't live like people who will be condemned for that lifestyle because you're a former offender. And just like the church in Corinth, so many believers today live a life that looks just like the culture that they were saved out of. And we might not be suing each other, but I have a feeling that we'd get a very similar letter. And so I want to put something up on the screen. The gospel affects more than just your salvation. It's supposed to change who you are. So as we leave here today, I think what we need to do is we need to spend some time accepting who we really are. And I don't mean that in some like fluffy, self-improving, you know, you need to love yourself more and just accept who you are kind of way. What I mean is we need to accept who we are and the responsibility that comes along with it as members of the kingdom of God, co-heirs with Christ, ambassadors who bear the gospel to a broken world, and former offenders of a lifestyle contrary to what God wants. We need to wrestle with who we really are. And so here are some questions for you to spend some time with. Question number one, ask yourself this, what do I value that God doesn't? Do I prioritize something that God doesn't? Or what does God want that I don't want? Question number two, what am I doing that might make the gospel unappealing to believer, unbelievers around me? Am I watering it down so much that it makes no difference? Am I living in such a way that they can't tell that there's a reason to believe? What am I doing that might make the gospel unappealing to unbelievers around me? And then here's the last one. How different is my life from the culture around me? How different is my day to day, my Tuesday afternoon, than the culture around me? Because the gospel should affect more than just your salvation. It should change who you are. And I think that once we realize who we are, we're going to stop acting like who we aren't. Let me pray over you guys really quick, and then we can go. Father, we, we, <laughs> I think some of us have an identity crisis. I think some of us have spent enough time um, giving ourselves permission, enough time um, basking in your grace, enough time listening to the culture tell us who we should be, who we're allowed to be, that we have gotten so off track, we don't even know who we are. We don't know what it means to be in your kingdom. We don't know what it means to hold your gospel. Would you forgive us? God, we thank you that you've cleansed us of all of our unrighteousness, that you've washed away our shame, we thank you that you've sanctified us and given us a transformed life to live into. We thank you that you've justified us and that you see us worthy of your presence. Now, God, would you work in us, compel us to live into those truths that they would be evident to a world around us that doesn't know you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said...